In today's video, I'm going to talk to you about the three most popular times that people take the MCAT as well as my personal favorite. With my experience tutoring hundreds of students, maybe maybe close to a thousand now, to really high scores on the MCAT. For those of you that don't know me, my name is John. I'm a fourth year medical student. I just submitted my residency application, so I'm about nine months away. I spent a couple years tutoring for one of the national MCAT companies and I started my own business, Informing Future Doctors, and this associated YouTube channel with my business partner and sister Maggie, who's the other tutor you'll see on this channel. The goal of making these videos is to give more individuals like yourself a chance to get into medical school because the advice is convoluted and it's also expensive and we want to give away the best secrets and the most secrets that we can while having affordable products on the back end that allow us to continue doing that. The three times that people usually test for the MCAT is either in the month of January, the month of May, or sometime during the summer and they all have their strengths. I'll go through those quickly and then I'll talk about my favorite. I think the most popular time to take the MCAT is actually in May and the reason for that is because it theoretically allows you the longest time to study and you're probably not studying that whole time but it gives you the most amount of time if you are a procrastinator but it also allows you to make sure that you submit early enough so that you are one of the first students reviewed because a lot of medical schools will do interviews on like a rolling admissions basis. You want to make sure that your application is in as early as possible and if you test in May even like the end of May then most years you'll be able to be considered in that first review pile of applicants. The second most popular time to study and test for the MCAT is actually in the summer. And the main reason that people like to study in the summer or test in the summer is because it gives them, you know, like a month and a half, two months of just dedicated MCAT studies, which is a really good thing. But it often leads to a lot of students kind of like procrastinating throughout their spring semester and getting nothing done. And even if you get like a pretty good MCAT score, like a 508, well now you're submitting your application later and so a 508 that might would have gotten you an interview if you had tested in May or January now that 508 is gonna be really difficult to get you an interview because you're submitting your application in August so you're very late and they have very few spots left to fill so they're reserving those for the people that study late and make like a 518 or 515 or something like that so neither of those two options are wrong and I've tutored a lot of students that scored great during those time periods and that ended up getting into medical school and are close to finishing up. But with that being said, they're not my favorite time to study for the MCAT. My favorite time to take the MCAT for all students is in January. And there's several reasons why I think testing in January is the best idea that you can do. Number one, you have your score back in time to submit your application early. And if you like get like a 508, you decide, oh, well, maybe I need a little bit more research or some more clinical experience or something like that. Then you can tailor your application and start finishing that up and working on your application by itself rather than trying to work on your application and the MCAT at the same time, because that's a little overwhelming. The next thing that I really like about testing in January is the same reason that people test in the summer. It's that when you test in January, you have your entire winter break to dedicate to studying hard for that exam so that you can rip out a bunch of practice exams because I mean they take eight hours it's really difficult to schedule time to take an eight hour or three eight hour practice exams in a week if you're in classes as well so testing in January is a great way to get around that it does kind of suck like you may have to study through Christmas break but that way you kind of get it over with and then your entire summer is just like stress-free enjoyment you can go to Bali or whatever you people do for fun. Now, one of the pushbacks you'll get a lot it, whenever I'm telling students, like, it's a good idea to test in January. Um, two of the pushbacks are, one, I may not have finished all of my pre-med classes or I'm finishing them in the fall semester, or two, my fall semester's harder, so I want to make sure that I have the time to do well in classes and the time to do well in the MCAT. Now, in general, most of you are going to have, like, most or all of your prerequisite or pre-MCAT classes taken by the time you get to test date in January. And while I understand like a lot of times fall semesters are a little bit more difficult and it may be harder for you to dedicate a couple hours a week to studying for the MCAT throughout that fall semester. From my students personal experiences my best scores have tested in January. I've heard a rumor that like the actual exam is easier is a little bit easier in January. I'm not sure if that's true or not but I have heard a rumor that like a lot of the beta questions that are too easy get counted in January, but then whenever they have like four or five months of proof that those questions are too easy, then they kind of get redacted out of the test set for the, the May and the summer testers. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but it makes a lot of sense to me. And the last reason that I think studying and testing in January is because if you are one of those students that unfortunately like myself, I mean, you probably know my story. I had to take the exam four times before I finally figured it out. You have a little bit of a safety net if you test in January and don't do as well as you wanted to. 
You know, if you if you make like a 508 and you're like, well, dang, the average student that gets accepted scores a 511, I want to test again. Well, now you have the entire spring semester to go up three points. You can totally do that. Or if you make a 496 and you need to go up 10, 15 points, you can definitely do that in a semester. I mean, that's the same amount of time that people that tested may normally study for. So it's a great option. It is my personal favorite option. If you were my student and you came to me today and you're like, hey, when should I take the MCAT? We'd sit down, we'd go over thing, everything, make sure that you're not like completely overwhelmed in fall, like much more so than you will be in the spring. And then I would probably say, let's test in January. Let's just go ahead and get this thing done. Now, lastly, I want to talk to you about how you should study if you're testing in January and some pitfalls that you might fall prey to if you were testing in January. How you should study in January is really no different than how you should study if you're planning to test any other time. And it's really those three big pillars that I preach on the channel. It's like, you got to know your content, you got to know your strategies, and then you've got to rip a ton of practice questions. Now, understand that's not like sage guru advice it's kind of like what everybody already knows and understands so let me go in a little bit deeper almost everybody that takes the MCAT knows the definitions of the sciences but then the average score is still like a 500 or a 502 why is that the case it's the case because even if you know the definitions and you have the stinking Kaplan textbooks memorized like I did whenever I took it twice and made a 502, or you may not know how those sciences relate to each other. You know, when you're an undergraduate, you're studying for like the next exam and you're really rewarded for memorizing PowerPoints juxtaposed to like reading textbooks and thinking about how, how all these interact. And you can even be punished for more like creative application based thinking like the MCAT requires. So it's it's not necessarily your fault. It's just kind of the way that our education system is set up is that, you know, we study for the next test and once we finish that, then we get overwhelmed. So we study for the next test. But the MCAT kind of punishes students that are going to end up doing that. Now, this revelation is kind of what led to me like spending a year deep diving in on the MCAT and figuring out all of its nuances and getting my 90th percentile score and then going on to tutor tons of students that have done that as well. And so that's that's when and how I created all these strategies that are on the channel. That's when and how I created like the study schedules and techniques that we use. And it's also whenever I started to kind of formulate this idea for what is truly high yield content on the exam. You know, if you take it four times like I did and then you talk to hundreds of your students that have taken it and ask them, you know, what'd you see on your test? Then you're going to get a good feel for what pops up commonly. And what pops up commonly is what we have put in our high yield courses. So if you're a student like I was that maybe you've taken a practice exam or maybe you've taken the real MCAT and you didn't score as well as you wanted to and you're like that's kind of weird like when I'm reviewing these questions I knew the sciences but I, did, I still didn't get the question right. Maybe I didn't even understand the question. Maybe I didn't like deeply understand the sciences or the passages itself, then you really need to look into considering the UWorld XIFD course that we offer. It'll be the first link in the description. But what that's gonna do, that's gonna have our entire book where we walk you through like all like the 40 or 50-ish high yield topics that we consistently saw in the MCAT that all of our students are telling us is consistently on the MCAT. And then we have associated lectures with those chapters where we're walking you through, teaching you those sciences, talking about how they interact with each other. And then we're telling you how we saw them tested on the MCAT. You know, there's only like three or four ways that amino acids are tested on the MCAT, but I can promise you that they're not gonna ask you which amino acid has the one letter abbreviation for A, like you might be asked in like a biochemistry pop quiz or something like that. It's detailed, it's nuanced but it's predictable. So if you're looking for a structured way to study that's gonna have content with associated lectures that talk about the application, detailed strategies to make some of like the weird non-tangible parts of the MCAT feel a little bit more structured and algorithmic, as well as the best practice passages that you can get with the associated reviews in UWorld, you should really look at the UWorld XIFD course. Link will be in the description. So that's one way you should study the next. Another really good idea is for you to go ahead and take a practice exam now just to know where you are. Because you know, if you take a practice exam and you're already at a 515 and you just need to get to like a 518, you can probably just like study with our free YouTube channel or like watch some free Khan Academy videos and get to that 518 or just take some practice passages, just the WMC practice test. You'll probably get to that 518. But you know, if you take that practice exam, you make a 500 and you're like, dang, the schools I'm interested in, their average accepted score is like a 512. You probably are going to need some additional help. And I know most students want to try to tackle it on their own. I know that I did as well, but I wasted freaking two or three years of my life trying to tackle it on my own. And I literally just wrote a paragraph in my residency application about how one of the biggest regrets in my life is that I tried to tackle undergraduate on my own. Mentors and mentorship are very, very important and you'll really understand 
understand that as you get into medical school, you start learning from these attendings and things like that, but go ahead and establish that if you can. And if that needs to be for the MCAT, then myself and the other tutor, Maggie, were happy to be those mentors. So once you've got that practice test score, set yourself a goal score, you know, what you really want to score. If the average for, you know, the schools that you're interested in or like your state school or 512, then aim for a 515. If the average is a 508, aim for a 512 or something like that. Because if you do get, you know, like a standard deviation above their average MCAT score, it's very possible that you can get a scholarship. I got a scholarship to medical school for my MCAT and it paid for half of my tuition. So the money that I invested into getting help on the MCAT really, really paid it in dividends. And the biggest pitfall that people fall prey to whenever they're studying for the MCAT to test it in July is they have in their mind that I will have the safety net that I can take it again in May. Don't plan for that. Whether that's consciously or subconsciously don't allow yourself to plan for that like kick those demons out right so if you haven't taken the mcat and you're wondering when you should take it just take it in january but you need to start studying now don't put it off dedicate like two hours a day to studying you can take a day off or whatever but dedicate a significant amount of time to study for your mcat because as important as undergraduate classes feel and you're like oh if i get a b then i'm not going to get into med school i had like three C's in undergraduate, maybe just two. Regardless, I had C's in undergraduate. One of them was my senior year, but I had a very good MCAT score. So if you have that great MCAT score, then it goes ahead and proves that you're smart enough to handle the course load of medical school. Whereas if you have a 4.0, but you also scored a 502, well, they're gonna be a little bit worried about you. And it's not necessarily fair. I'm just trying to level with you about what the truth of the matter is. It's all about that score. If you don't have the MCAT score, then you can't even get in the door to prove to them that you are this great person that's going to make this great physician, which I have no doubt that you are. But I'm just trying to tell you the truth that if you don't have the score, you're not even going to get to show them that. So if you are talking to yourself now, you're like, all right, I'm convinced I'm going to take the test in January. I'm going to put in the time for it, but I don't necessarily know what to do. I would highly, highly, highly encourage you to invest in our UWorld XIFD course. I would not recommend it so highly if I didn't believe that it was going to get you that 515 that you need. And if you go ahead and sign up in the next, let's say, 10 days, then we'll go ahead and get you the Anki course for free. That way you're going to be able to use the Anki flashcard app. I'm going to walk you through how to download it, how to ins how to get through like that horrible learning curve that is Anki and get you to being functional with that within the, I think it's like an hour and a half, two hours worth of videos. I'll show you screen recordings of how to do the whole thing, which decks to pull, which cards to pull, and how to make it work seamlessly with whatever studying approach you're intending on using. Thanks for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.